Hey, this is Ryan and Joey doing the introduction for Hi. episode 82 of the Clive Barker podcast. Uh, this episode is a little bit of Clive Barker news and a whole lot of talking about the Great In Secret show. So do you have anything you want to add, Joey? Yeah. What do you want to say? It's trending. What? It's trending. Okay. All right. So enjoy. I guess the first thing is is uh, Michael Plumides just announced that uh, Craig Sheffer is going to be joining the uh, the Nightbreed panel at Epic uh, EpicCon Ohio. Oh yeah, that's going to be in Dayton, Dayton, Ohio. Yeah. So uh, cool. Yeah. I mean, I think Craig Sheffer hasn't been uh, in too many screenings. I think uh, yeah. you know people like Simon Bamford, Nicholas Vince, and Bobby have been to many more screenings than he has. And yeah. uh, it's it's great because he's he's the main actor, he's the lead actor in the in the movie. So uh, that that's cool that he's yeah. getting his spot as well. Yeah, October twenty fifth, uh, he'll be there. So I, I, one thing I I had noticed that at uh, I think it was Mad Monster Party that he he stayed he stayed up super late and uh, didn't come in the next day <laughs> to the convention. So you know, yeah, there, <laughs> but. Um, and also in Burlingame, um, the screening I went to uh, here close to San Francisco, right by the airport, he was supposed to, to have been a part of the panel as well with Russell and Ann Bobby, I think. But oh, at the yeah, last yeah. minute, he couldn't come because there was some kind of uh, family emergency that he had to take care of. And so he yeah, couldn't make it. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's good news for everybody going to EpicCon Ohio um, because – you know, now you'll have one more autograph you can put on your Nightbreed uh, Blu-ray inserts or whatever you want to get signed. And posters and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you can go and ask. Uh, you can you can scream out for his name, Boone. Yeah, and we didn't mention this before going on to the next one. We didn't mention this before, but I think this is not super new news. But uh, Shout Factory is going to be uh, is going to be releasing a. Uh, a Blu-ray of Candyman Two: Farewell to the Flesh. Yeah, that's that's going to be good. It's but this movie does something that sequels are supposed to do, which is it adds to the story, and it, it's it's as good as the first one, I think. I mean, it, it expands mm-hmm. the story into new territories, and so I, I like that one. Uh, it takes place in New Orleans, which is you know a, a wonderful backdrop for the whole story, and yeah. I'm really happy that they're uh, putting it out. I mean. Uh, Candyman One was already yeah. in Blu-ray, right? Uh, sort of. Yes. I mean, I think there's like a Canadian version of the Blu-ray. Oh, that's okay. not that. That you know, it's it's hard to get now. Ah. Um, it and Candyman. Um, for for me, I think that I like the first one a lot better, but I don't have a lot of fault with the second movie, and I think that it's better than any sequel to a horror movie can be expected to be. Yeah, and also there's some really f- cool things they do in the movie in the beginning like we we have the we have a character from the first movie who appears in the second movie and he's written a book about what happened to Ellen in the first yeah. movie, right? Yeah. And the the thing is I really enjoy that detail. Oh, the the dust the dust jacket. Yeah. Yeah, the dust jacket it's, it's, on that yeah. book is is mirrored it's like a mirror so he looks into that and he says Candyman five times and i thought that was a good detail yeah 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 that was that was pretty cool they used the the you know the trope of somebody jumping out and scaring everybody or you know not being Candyman when you expect it to be Candyman. and yeah that's kind of spoiler you uh, know but yeah uh i thought that was yeah. really cool i would like to see a, uh, a standalone edition of uh the forbidden with like a mirrored cover that would have been cool yeah, yeah. Um, and we did an entire episode about that movie. Yeah. 
uh, a while back. I can't even remember what number or how long ago, but but yeah. So then the next one, speaking of of Shout Factory, Shout Factory has released details of the new Lord of Illusions uh, Blu-ray that's that's going to be coming out on December sixteenth for twenty nine dollars and ninety three cents. It looks like yeah. they're going to really pack it in with uh, plenty of uh, special features, including some unseen footage. Yeah, yeah, which is really cool. So, I mean, I, I would j- have just been happy if it had all the same stuff as the DVD, but it was in high definition. But it's more than that. It's it's um, Well, it says commentary by Clive Barker, and we don't know if that's the commentary that was on the DVD where he calls it a laser disc because it's the same commentary from the laser disc. It could be. Or if it's a new one. Yeah. If I had to hazard a guess, I would say it's probably the old one. Yeah. Well, if they do a new one, it would be nice if they kept the old one, too. I mean, just make it an alternate. Oh, yeah. but Al- it, Alternate track. They do take the time to uh, indicate in these special features which are going to be uh, new ones. Like, they, they yeah. say there's going to be an unseen, rare, behind-the-scenes footage illusion of reality. Vintage interviews and unseen on-set footage provide a fascinating look into the making of the film. So this illusion of reality is going to be a really cool featurette, I guess. Um, and the deleted scenes have Clive Barker's commentary. That was in the DVD also. Because mm-hmm. I remember him talking about the um, oh the uh, the demon that says, taste the darkness, more we've been waiting for you. And there was a scene, an extra scene with that demon. And he, I remember him talking about that. Sure, yeah, yeah. And there's yeah. going to be also a new interview with the storyboard artist for Lord of Illusions, who was Martin Mercer. And, uh, oh, that's cool. That's going to be cool. I don't think I've ever seen any storyboards from Lord of Illusions. Yeah. Well, and the nice thing is that it, it is it this is going to have – won't this also have the, the theatrical cut or am I wrong? That's interesting. It says here that it will include both the theatrical and director's cut. Yeah, yeah, which is cool. That's never been done before except for the 101 films release in uh, the Region 2 or I guess it would be Region B, right? Yeah, uh, B. Uh, they, they they only managed to include uh, the theatrical in HD, but unfortunately the director's cut was in standard definition because, yeah, MGM couldn't locate the footage yeah for the director's cut. So uh, now apparently they have solved that problem, and if they haven't, yeah. uh, Scream Factory is also noted for uh, going in and doing another uh, HD scan of of the, the film elements. So, well, and I think 101 Films should have waited. Really, I mean. Was it that important to get that release out, like, right then? So important that they couldn't just wait and see if they could get the the high-definition director's cut? Yeah, I don't know exactly how that went, so maybe they were just like, we'd love to make, you know, this is just me speculating, they probably said we'd love Mm -hmm. to make a a double-disc edition of this, and they were probably, like, told by MGM, well, we can give you, like, the, you know, theatrical cut, but but we don't know where the director's cut is, and we don't have it now. And so probably they just said, okay, we'll just do it in standard definition, I guess. Yeah, and this kind of thing does happen all the time. You see you see all kinds of releases of movies that are not as great as you would like them to be or bare bones or, you know, or, or, or packaged in with a bunch of movies all together that don't seem to be related to each other. This one's going to have uh, the full package. So a new high-definition transfer of uh, his director's cut. Uh, like you said, the commentary, the Gathering of Magic featurette, which I think mm-hmm. is the one you can find on YouTube. There's there's one uh, making of uh, featurette on YouTube about Lord of Illusions, which I think might have been from the Laserdisc. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. It was from so, the Laserdisc. Oh. So on Laserdiscs, what you would do is is switch the audio track from uh, from stereo to mono, and then the mono audio track would you know on on box sets and stuff would have audio commentary. Yeah, there you go. So another another brief news. I mean, I don't know if, if this is even news anymore because it's kind of a tradition now. But Clive Barker's going to be at Miss Kitty's Halloween Ball on on uh, on the day of Halloween on October thirty first, um, which is a Friday this year. Yeah, it's like the third time I think that I know of that yeah. he's been, uh, present there. And usually yeah. he also becomes a, a judge for like the, the the character costumes that these people will will wear in the ball. So yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah, and then uh, and then on a rumor uh, we just heard from somebody at um, on Occupy Media that the Nightbreed Boom Studios comic uh, is going to end its run at twelve issues. 
And uh, I, I asked him, what's your source on this? And he just said spot of inside information. Hmm. So we'll just have to file this under a rumor for right now. Yeah, I guess because uh, I haven't heard anything about this. I know the yeah. next testament was supposed to be 12 issues. Um, yeah. Boom, Boom Studios, sometimes they do interrupt the, the numbering, the numbers of the um, – they they yeah. interrupt the numbers of the comic books and then they start new story arcs starting again from one. So I don't know if yeah. if this is what they're talking about or if it's actually going to be just twelve issues. I hope not because yeah, you know they they're, they've been really good so far and uh, they're still halfway. Well, it, it, yeah, and it's a weird thing to wrap your mind around because really all of those Hellraiser comics up until Bestiary kind of belong together in one you know in one set, but. At the same time, that allows the that allows the uh, the artists to get their particular run or their story arc done, and know that it's going to be finished. That they're not just going to be cut off some di- some day when somebody says, "You know what? This isn't really profitable. We need to stop." Yeah, I think so. So cause... at least at least having an end goal, and then say, "Well, if it's still profitable, we'll start again on a new story arc." And then, sure. and so it's sort of like uh, when a tenant is on month to month tenancy instead of on a on a lease, right? I <laughs> guess want, that's one you, way to you're, see. You're, you're you're not as committed. Uh, you're not as committed to the you know to that that series forever. That's one way to go about it. Um... Like yeah. they, they stopped Hellraiser numbers at uh, 21 or 22, and then they started The Road Below. And, uh, I think it was 20. 20, right? Okay. And then they yeah. started the other one where uh, Spencer joins the other Hell and stuff. So I don't know. And, and yeah. even Hellraiser Bestiary. The Dark is, Watch. Yeah, the Dark Watch. And Hellraiser Bestiary is still um, – it's still using the continuity of those first uh, Hellraiser runs. Um, so, it is, but we don't have any, any central characters. No. Yeah. But anyway, so that's cool. Uh, the cover for number six and a preview for number six of Nightbreed has come out uh, today. Yeah. So have you read number five yet? No, I haven't. I have. I have only up to number four so okay. far. I, I I picked up number five and um and Bestiary number three. I think it is. Mm-hmm. I have Bestiary yeah. number two, so I need to go by the okay. uh, comic book store and pick those. Or no, up. it was Bestiary number two and Nightbreed number five. That's what I picked up on last week. I think on Friday. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I I, I really like them. Um, Nightbreed is very similar to, uh, you know, very similar to the ones before it. It's um, it's 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 another uh, set of two origin stories. Mm-hmm. Um, it it without, seems like yeah. Lylesburg is still gathering everybody, so I'm I'm anxious to yeah. see where the story is going to go because ultimately I think we're going to be seeing uh, Midian, and uh, he's talking to uh, to Boone ever since the first episode. He's like giving Boone a retrospect of how the breed came to uh, migrate to Midian. So uh, that that's interesting. We get to see a lot of origin stories, which is for the night breed. It's what a lot of the fans like to see its origin stories because in the movie a lot of those characters we never even got to hear their names yeah that's true i mean we knew their names from uh nightbreed chronicles and from the credits i don't remember if narcisse ever actually speaks out his name during the director's cut do you remember no no he doesn't and i was looking for that right yeah yeah he says remember me dr narcisse i mean that's what he says in the cabal cut that's but they true. but they took that out and I don't know why. I know it's uh, yeah. one of those things that I think uh, would really add more to the movie because people know he's Narcisse yeah. because of the comic books and the book. But yeah. really, in the movie, if if all you saw was the movie, you would never know his name. And and I think there are two camps. I mean, well, this isn't a Nightbreed podcast, but I I feel like there are two two ways of looking at this movie. Right? There's one where you're trying to make it a fast paced, commercially successful movie. And there's another way where you're trying to uh, you're trying to appeal to the longtime fans and put things in there that are like nods to them and and uh, and improve the lore and and explain things and stuff like that and and I don't know I guess the Cabal cut was really more that side and this new one is is maybe a little more center. Yeah, I would agree yeah. with that assessment. We still haven't given our review of the of Cabal Cut. I'm um, sorry, the director's cut of yeah. Nightbreed, but we definitely will as soon as we come back from uh, from Los Angeles because uh, yeah, well then we'll have an entire episode of 
interviews and discussion about uh, about the director's cut of Nightbreed. So we're we're going to try to hold off. I yeah, guess we're looking forward. <laughs> to it. Yeah. So um, really quick site news. Uh, so we have done, you know, Clive Barker podcast presents fundraiser two. Uh, we've done three of those drawings so far, and I've 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 mailed out the. Um, I've mailed out the the things that people have have been you know have gotten. Uh, I've mailed out the prizes, I guess you would say, mm-hmm. trying to avoid that word because it you know we're not supposed to be doing a raffle according to to PayPal. That's true. <laughs> but we're, uh, we're doing uh, a giveaway, an appreciation yeah. giveaway for people who donate uh, to our podcast. But number four, this is a big one. This is the stuff that was donated to us from Seraphim. Yeah, uh, for the most part, uh, you know, with one exception. So, um, so we only have two. Uh, we only have two names right now in, for the drawing. So obviously, we can't do a drawing right now. So, as you're listening to this, if you want to get in on this, I would, you, you know, definitely uh, go down to the to the link at the bottom and and donate. And you know, for every twenty five dollars, we put your name into the pot, and it's not a raffle. Yeah. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> So the the first thing is um, an Everville poster, and you've probably seen I've had them on sale on eBay. Uh, but it's a it was an Everville promotional poster with a, a big black background with Clive Barker standing there, mm. and it says Everville underneath his feet. That's a pretty uh, nice poster. Yeah. Um, so that that's that one. Uh, that one's from my collection, and then um, uh, again a Jacqueline S promotional tote bag. So it's kind of like a, a canvas shopping bag. So we. We already gave one of those away. This is the second one. Uh, it says Jacqueline S. on one side, and it says Seraphim and Raven Banner on the other side. Pretty cool promotional article. Yeah, and then uh, T-shirts. So we have two large T-shirts. Uh, so, you know, it's again, if you win one of these um, just let, and it's the wrong size, just let us know and we'll put your name back in the pot because there's, I think, going to be at least one more drawing. Yeah, both uh, T-shirts are large size, and they have been donated by Seraphin from the official Clyde Barker store. Yeah, and, and you can see how they look like. Either go to this, go to our fundraiser blog post, which we'll put on the show notes, and you can see pictures of them, or you can go to the real Clyde Barker, you know, store and check out the T-shirts they have there. Yeah, but yeah, so you can find out what models we are uh, uh, putting in the, you know, yeah, giveaway. That's probably easier than us describing them right now. Sure, but it's yeah. Clyde Barker art, and they're white T-shirts, large. Yeah, and and I think they're both Aberat art. Mm-hmm. Um, and then so then the last thing, this is the big one, is uh, uh, an autographed copy of the hardcover of Chiliad of Meditation. So yeah, autographed by Clive Barker, Chiliad of Meditation. It's a recent uh, publication. Um, I, I forget was that Seraphim Inc. or was that one uh, was that one like another publisher? No, that wasn't um First Tales was Seraphim Inc. Yes, First Tales was Seraphim Inc. Chile Chile Meditation had... was from Subterranean Press. Subterranean, okay. Yeah. I yeah, there's Earthling and Dark Regions and Subterranean and I I sometimes mix them up. I know, it used to be just Harper Collins for everything, but <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, that one uh, it's in great condition, uh autographed by Clive Barker and it's a hardcover and it's a story that I feel that a lot of Clive Barker fans haven't read because it was previously only in a only in a story compilation that was like celebrating the oncoming Y2K. Yeah, these are two uh kind of bookend stories and they're together here, but uh, I think they were very nice stories. It's been some of the best stuff I've read from Clyde Barker, to be honest. Yeah. It was a very cathartic story that Clyde Barker wrote. He was in the throes of a depression at the time, and uh, he kind of worked it out by writing this story. So it's about a man and a river, but we're not going to spoil it for you. Uh, just yeah. This is a publisher copy, by the way. It's a non-numbered but autographed copy that says publisher's copy, PC. Yeah. Yes. So. Exactly. So that's uh, so that's the big one. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, or, and uh, and if you get your get your donations in here, um, then we'll put your name in the pot, and you get a chance to win that. And so far, I mean, I've got to say, right now there's one name in the bucket. I've got one more that I need to put in there, uh, and then and then uh, after that. We we just need to wait until we get more. Um, but so far, almost everybody that's contributed has gotten something. Yeah, we need to have at least, I would say, at least six 
uh, names yeah. in the pot to be able to do a, a proper um, yeah. uh, giveaway because otherwise if we have less people than prizes, we can't really do it. And if we have yeah. the same number, it's still like at least six, you know, for five prizes, at least yeah. six. So there's like some measure of um, luck involved. And we've got enough contributions from other people also to make a, a fifth drawing after yeah. this one. So, you know, if you get your – is the sooner we get this one finished, the sooner we can do our last one too. And we, we're still, you know, kind of in the red for this. But um, yeah, you guys are helping us out, keep the, the podcast alive for another year. So thank yeah. you very much for everybody who's thinking about donating. Yeah, and if we ended up stopping here, I mean, I would have a bunch of prizes that I'd feel awkward about. But honestly, I mean, I would feel okay because we've been helped out quite a bit already. Um, yeah, it's really nice to to feel the support of all these people who have been yeah. contributing. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so our main topic, and this is a big one, and it's this is an episode we've been putting off uh, for various reasons um, for a few weeks now, um, maybe even like a month. Uh, the Great and Secret Show, the first book of the art. Yeah. So it's a little intimidating because it's a very, you know, it's a very epic book. It's part of a trilogy, which when I first read it, I had no idea it was going to be a trilogy. But over yeah. the years, it, it, it kind of developed that way. Um, so it's an amazing book. It was yeah. probably, let me see, which one? I read Cabal first, I think. Yeah, and this is the next, the very next year after. So Cabal was written in 1988. Great and Secret Show was written in 1989 at the same time that he was filming Nightbreed, just to give you an idea of his stamina. True, yeah. So he was um, he was living. Uh, Clyde Barker was living in a, in a loft at Wimpole Street uh, at the time that he started the epic trilogy of novels known as The Art. I think the inspiration for this came from. Um, the fact that Clyde Barker was a fan when he was younger of uh, the Tolkien books. Mm. And so he always wanted to do this kind of like epic trilogy as well. One that he would create this entire backdrop and this entire world. That's, huh. that's, that's how this came. Yeah. I'm quoting, I'm going to be quoting extensively from shadows in Eden and also from okay. the dark fantastic, the authorized biography by Douglas winter, because there, there's a lot of cool information here and on, on revelations, Clyde Barker info about, what surrounded like Clyde Barker's uh, production of Great and Secret Show? So that's that's it's pretty interesting stuff here. Yeah, and the the, the story. This is the first uh, novel that takes place in the United States, right? I mean, I think. Um... Yeah this this was not only one of his most successful novel in the United States. It was also, I think, the first novel that uh, sold over a million copies. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's big. So. And and I think um, what was we were, we we've talked about this a lot of times I guess but um, but uh, it, it's you know it was like Weave World it was a departure from horror I mean there are horror, horror elements to the Great and Secret Show but but it's really kind of a contemporary fantasy novel with horror elements in it. I had seen Clyde Barker's poetry I think for the first time in Weave World indirectly from you know the mouth of. Uh, Lemuel Lowe. Yeah, yeah. The Orchard of Lemuel Lowe. Uh, it's kind of a tricky name to pronounce. Mm -hmm. But that's where he had the six commonplaces poetry that uh, is recited by um, yeah by Cal Mooney. Mm -hmm. And in this one, this book is epigraphed by this fantastic little poem, which uh, over the years has found its way into several titles and several references, but like like uh, Phil and Sarah's books, Memory, mm -hmm. Prophecy, and Fantasy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's I think my favorite uh, little Clive Barker epigraph. Or oh yeah, so it's it it yeah. stands like Memory, Prophecy, and Fantasy: the past, the future, and the dreaming moment between are all one country living one immortal day. To know that is wisdom. To use it is the art. So I I love it. I mean, I wrote yeah. I wrote some notes here about this poem. Um I think this line comprises the world as you experience uh, yeah. as as our experience of it. Um not just what we remember or or believe it to be, but what we think it will be and you know, when you put in fantasy, it's how we would like it to be. So it's pretty much a way to envelop everything oh, what yeah. is and what yeah. isn't. You know, this 
the past, the future, and the dreaming moment are all one country. Yeah, in our mind, I think that 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 is true. It can be. I mean, all our minds, we can view this wonderful country as as singularly beautiful as the next person, and just as unique because it's our individual experience. And when he says living one immortal day, um, I mean, these are all three ways to experience existence. Whether yeah. whether it's how we remember it, how we shape our paths through self-fulfilling prophecies or by trying to change the very nature of the universe uh, like artists do. Artists try to apply their artistic sensibility and change the world and remake it in a shape that, you know, they, they, they want it to be. So I think that that's a fantastic poem here. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot to appreciate in this book that reading it now as an adult uh, is a lot different than reading it as a as a young adult or teenager, you know, that I did earlier. So, you know, going back to that quote, um, there's a there's a theme throughout this whole novel of crossroads, and and where um, where the dreaming mind intersects with the physical world, and uh, and you know, and, and the idea of of time not being linear and and um, it, it's kind of, kind of a almost a, a, a Neil Gaiman esque and kind of a quantum physics vibe to it. I, mm, I guess, yeah. 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 I mean, this this novel is so deep, and it's you know, I think that it, people forget that because Magica came out so soon after, and that novel is really really deep. Uh, but this one is too. Yeah, and and from the Dark Fantastic, here's a. Um... Something that might explain where the Yad Ouroboros came from. Mm-hmm. Um, it says here, as a youth, Clive would prefer the dour, labyrinthine fantasies of E.R. Edison, and particularly the Icelandic scholar's masterful first novel, The Worm Ouroboros, from 1922. Mm. So that, that might have something to do with the fact that he called the, 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 you know, yeah. the dark force in this story the Yad Ouroboros, yeah. which is, you know, the Ouroboros is the snake biting its own tail. It's kind of this yeah. alchemical symbol. And yeah. uh, it's cool. But the, the description of them is uh, contradictory and strange. And, and the closer they get to you, the more people become insane. Uh, they're described at one point as mountains and fleas, right? That's how, that's how the Jaff describes them. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and Tesla sees them as giants. And uh, in the comic book, and I don't know if you want to go into the comic books because we, we – Yeah, we can a little bit, sure. They, they – Design them in the background in some panels as these humanoid figures, but they look mi- they look like they're wearing some kind of like weird armor that's all jagged and pointy. Yeah. But I don't think that in my when I imagined the Yada Rubbers, I I saw them more like a like a more like a Lovecraftian kind of creature, like this yeah. absurd thing, you know, cosmic horror where you can't can't even understand what you're looking at uh, yeah. because. Yeah you can't make sense of something that doesn't belong to your reality because it doesn't follow any, you know, laws that we're used to. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and they, they, uh, the, 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 ad like our world, uh, because they want to take the order in our world and turn it into chaos. It's, or, or something, something kind of along those lines, or there was something about the way our world is fixed and theirs isn't. And they, that's what they crave. Yeah, and like you were saying, they want to they want to torture our existence until the whole universe sobs, and that's when they, that's 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 actually a quote from the book. Yeah. That's what they would like to do to us. They would like to dump the world into madness to the point where everything would be so chaotic that the universe itself would sob for yeah. uh, for death. You know. And and there's the Clive Barker rule, right? Where he he had said, I think in. Um in the thief of always that evil is always undone by its own appetite. And, Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got different varying levels of, of bad guys in this, in this story. Right. And they, you know, and, and at some points the bad guys become helpful. Some of the bad guys become helpful. Some of them don't. Some, some are straight evil and some are, are, uh, some are, are misunderstood or, or, um, or, um, uh, have a change of heart. I guess you could say. Sure, sure. And some yeah. don't even understand exactly what their agenda entails, like like Tommy Ray. I mean, yeah. uh, we we will probably be getting into spoiler territory, but we'll, we'll try to, you know, yeah. give warning when we go. Some of these characters in the book, they 
some are good, some are bad, some are just in between. I mean, some are just human, you know? Yeah, and it, and it's really interesting. I mean, I think you put your yourself in the place of some of these characters and think, what would I do? And it, it and it's hard to know the answer. But I think some of them, um, yeah, like Tommy Ray is sometimes sympathetic and sometimes not. Uh, Randolph Jaffe or the Jaff is sometimes he's sympathetic, sometimes he's not. Um, we've got other characters that are more good. I think uh, Joe Beth and Howie, uh, we're supposed to sympathize a little more with. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and the and Fletcher, I don't. Yeah, I mean, probably more so than the Jaff. Um, Raul, I think you know. Raul is more of an innocent character in this. Yeah, I think, for example, there is almost like a critique of how much ignorance can damn you in the case of the Jaff, because the Jaff he starts out as a rather bland, like human character, like. He's not really a good person or a bad person. He's more like this guy who's just walking through life, a little like Frank. He's, yeah. He he wants more, but he doesn't really know what he wants. And then he discovers this secret because Randolph Jaffe, he's mm-hmm. a guy who goes to work at the Omaha dead letter office, which right off the bat is is almost like metaphorical because this is like – this is all about yeah. the crossroads in this in this book. But the crossroads can be – uh, literal or symbolic. Uh, yeah. As the story progresses, we understand that these crossroads are more like states of being crossed. Mm-hmm. They're not literal crossroads. They're like places right. where the miraculous meets the the human, and they walk in changed. And that so, sets up a met that metaphor really well because Omaha is not the dead center of the United States, but for the purpose of of the mail system, it it is the crossroads of the United States. Sure. Yeah. Jaffe. Or I should call him Randolph Jaffe. He's going to be mm-hmm. called a Jaff later on. That's one of like Clyde Barker's uh, artifices. Sometimes he he gives a character a name, but then he gives it another name as the story yeah. progresses. Another name that means that there was a change done to the character. Yeah. Um, so Jaffe, he was in the le- dead letter office, and these are uh, he finds that there are letters who don't get lost on their own. They're deliberately lost. They're like this this secret that people write, like they confess these things to the world and then they just throw it in the system, hoping that it will change someone. That mm-hmm. you know, at the other end, they're not really addressed to anybody in particular. They're just thrown into the mail service as a way of um, chronicling their secrets and throwing them out there. Yeah. And he finds mentions here and there, and he starts piecing everything everything together. Um, so he becomes so absorbed in this that it's almost like he becomes a magnet for this stuff. It's almost like these things happen for a reason at some point. And he becomes so enthralled with the idea that there's this secret art. There is an art, but there is no artist, right? Yeah, well, and even before, I mean, obviously, we're not going to go through the entire story, but but uh, we are going to spoil things because we have to if we're talking about the book. But what I was going to say is that even even before he, he takes the nuncio that transforms him into the Jaff, he starts, the, just the knowledge of the art and the, the, the power that comes from that knowledge starts to change him a little bit. He doesn't, it seems like he doesn't need to eat anymore. He's, he's, this purpose suddenly makes him, gives him super strength, Mm -hmm. um, makes him more attractive to women. And men. Mm -hmm. And, um, he gets like all these free rides, women, women offering themselves to him in Illinois. Like, um, he, he ends up seeing, um, a, a youth's dead body uh, being pulled out of a um, river in Kentucky. And this um, mirrors the the medallion that he finds in one of the packages. Because at one point he starts discovering that there's maybe this group called the Shoal, or mm-hmm. you know, some, some people might call it something different. And he finds this medallion that depicts a, a, a human figure laying on its back, arms wide open, and this kind of cross, but it's not really a cross. It's more like there's there's a, a depiction on one axis uh, of a few symbols, and then on the other axis, there's a few other symbols that look like um, they 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 look like they represent an egg and a fish and the evolution of humankind. Mm-hmm. But this will become much more relevant uh, further 
near the end of the book. So we're yeah. not going to go into that right now. Well, and, and that, that illustration by Clive Barker of the Shoal medallion is in, uh, is on the first page, uh, the, the, of the, um, UK first edition. So yeah, if you, which is really weird because the American one doesn't have it. And I was no. looking at this paperback that I used to read the book and it does not have that illustration and it's no. really hard to find it on the internet. No, I think that, I think that was a, that was a poor choice by, uh, the people who did the U.S. edition. And, I think so you know, too. Yeah, because it's a really fine work of art. And the only place I could find it was on uh, Clive Barker dot info. Uh, and the and the, also the the cover on the U.K. first edition is so cool. It's so much better than the than the mailbox on the U.S. first edition. I think people bought that book despite the cover. <laughs> yeah. So Randolph Jeff starts. Um, starts traveling through America trying to gather experience and trying to find other um, sources of knowledge and, and people who can point him in the right direction to know more about mm -hmm. the secret. And at this point, even though he hasn't taken the Nuncio, he's really, I mean, he's really become a different person. He's got, he's got this new purpose. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, his old life is behind him. It's gone. Yeah. It's like he, uh, he becomes initiated into this, almost like new vision of reality that he yeah. uh, he wants to know more about. He wants to be – at one point he thinks, well, if there's an art but there's no artist, why can't I be that artist? You know? Yeah. So that becomes his goal, to be able to touch mm -hmm. touch this power and uh, use it, wield it, you know, become, become like the artist of the world, which is weird because Randolph Jaffe seems to be such an empty, empty man. I mean – he doesn't seem to be very imaginative or he doesn't seem to be very creative. In fact, most of the, the first part, he just spends it in kind of a daze, like um, like he's just a puppet being pulled along. Yeah. So I don't, I don't see how he would imagine himself to become this artist of reality. Uh, it, would, it would take someone who would be really creative to be able to create this new reality. Yeah. Yeah, and and that that's the thing about the the art is is uh, I think what he thinks is the art is completely different from the reality of it. So to him, um, it's it's so. I mean, I think in general in life, it's so much easier to destroy things, right? Right. So to him, the the art is just opening up, you know, tearing a hole between our world and the and the this other world, the, the you know, the metacosm and then and and quiddity and the ephemeris. Um, yeah. So that's it, he 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 dedicates his life to to ripping this hole in reality, and well, uh, and that's his mistake is thinking that that's what the art is. Yeah, and actually, um, okay, we're we're going into spoiler territory now, but mm -hmm. well, we have been. I yeah, we have been. Uh, that's true. I think that uh, in his search to know more about the art, what mm -hmm. Randolph Jeff ends up doing is. I think he ends up in his search, he, he changes, and this change kind of makes him special. It, it makes him stand out a little more yeah. to the point where he ends up meeting a former member of the Shoal and um, who's going to be Kasun. Well, and not – yeah, and it's not an ordinary meeting, right? He walks into a, a, he walks into a loop in time. Yeah, so here's the funny thing. So he – checks himself into a hotel, a motel, and he buys a couple of bottles of, of tequila or vodka, and he fasts, and he just drinks vodka, and he, he lets himself, like, float on the bed almost, you know, to the point where he's completely abandoning himself. And mm -hmm. he feels this calling and this tug and this thing call, tugging at his – almost at his inyards, and he ends up going barefoot into the desert, which is kind of like – um. A reflection of what happens in Weave World when uh, the the seller is going into the empty quarter. Yeah. With uh, Hobart. Hobart, yeah. Thank yeah. you. And yeah. they also kind of feel this this summoning right into the middle of the desert in in Weave World. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a reflection of what happens here. Like Jaffe walks almost an abandoned man. I mean, he's completely in a daze, and he he comes to this place where there's this. Uh, city and there's a steel tower and there's this hut and and he ends up going into the hut and he meets Kasun. Yeah. And so Kasun is a very interesting character. He's one of like Clyde Barker's best villains, I think. Yeah. He he Kasun is interesting because he tries really hard 
to be trustworthy and he just fails miserably at it all the time. I mean, no one can ever no you know, no one can ever believe what he says or trust him. Yeah, because he's so utterly corrupted inside and out. I mean, yeah. he's, he he's a character who's physically he looks ugly. He's like at one point it says that his body looks like it has been all his bones have been broken and reset misshapenly. <laughs> Yeah. And and he's just this naked guy sitting in a hut, almost like a shaman, except yeah. he's like this really perverted, <laughs> evil yeah. shaman. So, and he tells uh, Jeff that yes, he can initiate him into the uh, mysteries of the shoal, uh, which will come at a price. And and Jeff, he's not willing to pay that price just yet. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned the nuncio, and I, I know I'm going to go through the story a little bit, but mm-hmm. it's just for the, the first part so we can um, introduce some elements to discuss. He meets – he ends up uh, escaping Kasoon, and he decides that he will find his own way to, to use the art, to discover the yeah. art. Because at one point, Kasoon tells him that he – even though he has a glimpse of what's out there, he doesn't – he doesn't have the maturity or the, uh, the intelligence to to know what to do with it. So he was like, "You're like an ape." And then at one point he says, "You know, when I told you you were an ape, I I, I insulted the ape." <laughs> <laughs> so he yeah. thinks, "Okay, if I'm an ape, then I guess what I need to do is find a way to make myself smarter mm-hmm. or you know more evolved in some ways." Yeah. And so that's what he goes to look for. He looks for this guy called Fletcher. And this Richard Wesley Fletcher, who's a scientist, yeah. he's also a very flawed character. He's an uh, he's addicted to mescaline, mm. and in the scientific community, he's like an outcast because of his unorthodox um, methods. Yeah, and 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 one thing we didn't mention, it, it, you know, from from the beginning of the book on to this point, we're like in the '60s, I I think. I think this is supposed to be like 1969 or 1970 or something. So yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it is the '60s because because I mean it's only 1989 in the present, right? So so these characters have had needed time to grow up. No, yeah, absolutely. No, I'm just saying that when he meets Fletcher, it's still the '60s, and yeah. then they fight, and then they end up falling on Venturi County in Paloma Grove in 1971. Oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so <coughs> what happens here is that Fletcher. Um, is trying to find – he has a theory about dis, uh, discovering this biological imperative of evolution uh, almost. Mm-hmm. So he would call it the nuncio, which in Latin means the, the announcer. Yeah, or the messenger. Unexpectedly, he does succeed. He does succeed, and the first thing Fletcher creates uh, to prove the nuncio works is he had a, a, a monkey, uh, an ape. And he gives him the nuncio, and this this monkey becomes evolved to the point where he can communicate almost like a child, you know. Yeah. So this this yeah, ape will become he's like a chimp or an orangutan, maybe. But as soon as he does this, he understands that he's o- he's overstepping on some boundaries. He's he's helping Randolph Jeff. Um, he's he's putting in his hands something that he doesn't believe Jeff would put to good use. So he immediately regrets uh, creating the nuncio, and he decides that the only safe thing to do is to destroy it. Mm -hmm. Destroy it, destroy Raul, and kill himself. (laughs) So unfortunately, at this point, it's like uh, Jaff has such a, you know, he has such a a control and, 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 and he has such power that he can almost sense these things so as 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 soon as he starts burning everything jaffe senses that fletcher is trying to destroy his own work so he makes his way to the mission mm-hmm. and and uh what he finds there when he gets there is that fletcher has fallen victim to the nuncio because when he was picking up one of the jars to dispose of it the jar um the liquid kind of tries to climb the the walls of the container mm-hmm. so it's like the liquid is is alive and it ends up churning so much inside the, the tube that it explodes and splashes all over Fletcher, uh, transforming him into this powerful, you know, light-like creature. Yeah. When when Jeff goes there and uh, enters the mission, he finds Fletcher sitting in a chair, looking out at at the sun and then the landscape outside. And the only thing he's saying is, 
will I be sky? You know, can I, you know, can I become sky? Can I be in the clouds? And yeah. as soon as he touches him, like he, he sheds his physical body and he becomes this being of pure light. So of course, for the Jeff, this is amazing. I mean, he's like, Oh, this is what I want. I want this too. Yeah. Let me, yeah, give me some, give me some. Yeah. There's this kind of like confrontation where Fletcher is trying to make him understand that this nuncio, it will bring out, uh, it will overdevelop whatever you have inside you. And so in the case of the Jeff, uh, whatever he was going to turn himself into with the nuncio was going to be something that was not good. It, it was going to be something evil. So, yeah. He, yeah. I mean, honestly, he probably should have just thrown that into the sea instead of trying to talk him out of, <laughs> instead of trying to talk him out of doing it. Yeah. That's what he was trying to do. He was going to yeah. dump it in the ocean, uh, hoping that the dilution of the whole ocean would, would not, cause any major changes in the uh the creatures of the ocean but as soon as he picked it up the nuncio exploded and, yeah. and that's how they got him i wanted to see the super octopus yeah like the kraken <laughs> yeah <laughs> so he he had like uh three i think three vials of the nuncio yeah so one hits fletcher the other hits the randolph jeff and the other one is kept by raul um so ultimately What's going to happen here is that the Jeff and Fletcher are going to become these like super powerful creatures who transcend their own flesh. And immediately they become aware of each other as the antithesis, their nemesis. Yeah. So they embrace in a conflict. Uh, and uh, basically Fletcher is just doing all he can to prevent Jaffe from using his newfound powers. And the only way he can do that is to lock in perpetual conflict with him. Yeah, so they they sort of wage war across the United States and across decades. Yeah, yeah, and um, so Raúl is left at the mission, um, and um, the it's interesting because Clyde Barker once said while he was writing this book something I forgot to mention is that at first uh, he was going to uh, use instead of making this happen in California, he was going to make the action uh, happen in the Catskill Mountains. So he once said in 1988 to Fangoria, the locale has moved west from the Catskill Mountains. The story is now set in California. I now prefer to describe it as about sex, the movies, and Armageddon in Hollywood. But yes, it's still about good versus evil in America. I discovered during the last nine months in L.A. and it's uh, and its environment, that there were some things about that environment which were appropriate to the novel. The mm. West Coast is a relatively new experience for me, but in the last few months, I've had a concentration of experiences here. And uh, he goes on to say how the art took four months to research. And uh, even if he was busy painting in the studio during the day, he would make time in the evenings to work on that. Um, and then he, he concludes saying, one of the nice aspects about writing a book about the movies is that I'm actually involved in the type of situations I'm writing about. Yeah, because he was working on, you know, Nightbreed and stuff. Yeah. The art would be a big fan, as he said, in Hollywood about sex Armageddon in the movies, and it would come out in America and Britain in autumn of 89. So it, then he changed it to Ventura County, California, just a little way outside of Los Angeles. He, he does make the difference that while well, Weave World took place in Liverpool, it had certain uniquely British attitudes. Yeah. Then he went for what he thought was a particularly attractive part of America, California. Uh, and he, he went on to say – this was in 1988 as well uh, for fear. Um, he said, I have a love-hate relationship with California. I don't like it that much until I've gone from it. Then I wish I was back there. <laughs> Interesting, especially because he lives in Southern California, which is you know uh, much closer to the desert. I mean, yeah. I live in Northern California. I think Northern California is like the best place on earth. I mean, it's just perfect. He said that Great and Secret Show will have the same mixture of the fantastical and the strange and the sexual and the weird and the magical and the visceral as we will did. The kind of fiction which is in a lot of categories and so probably is in no category except imaginative fiction. And this is when he started like with Weave World. That was his big turn. But But this one – he just completely pressed the, the gas pedal and he went straight into fantasy territory. He was leaving the books of blood behind. But going back to um, the Jaff and Fletcher, who have now become these uh, incorporeal entities uh, fighting yeah. uh, over America. 
So they eventually settle in Pol- in a in a fictional town of Palomo Grove. Yeah, they do. California. They do fly over a bunch of places: Arizona, Colorado, Kansas, Illinois, Wyoming, and everywhere they go, they summon these creatures to use as an army against each other. So yeah. while Fletcher uh, summons dreams, hallucinogenia, yeah, the Jeff raises nightmares from people. The Tarata. Exactly, the Tarata. So ultimately, they become so spent in their battle that they float down onto Paloma Grove, California, uh, in Ventura County. And that's where part two begins, which is the League of Virgins. This is very, very um, – it's almost like they're, – they're almost like minor deities now. And so yeah. what any good deity has to do is at some point is impregnate a woman <laughs> to have like yeah. a son. Yeah, well, and it's kind of interesting that they've kind of both decided together. Well, I think Fletcher more reluctantly, but that they're so equal in in uh, in power that that uh, the best way to continue their war is is uh, to is to create agents in the world, you know, by making children. Exactly, and so there are these women, these uh, these girls, actually, they're teenage girls, and now we're talking about 1971. Yeah, these girls. Uh, there's been there's been a big rain and uh, this flood area was created and so they were like it was a really hot day and they decided to go for a swim. So unfortunately, what happens here is that place they go to is mm-hmm. actually it's actually located right on top of the cave where uh, the Jaff and Fletcher have fallen into. Mm-hmm. So what happens is that and like you said, uh, Fletcher a little more unwillingly than Jaff, but um, they end up snatching these girls and they do something to them they they enter them and they 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 kind of introduce this idea into their minds which is to go out and uh get pregnant <laughs> so yeah and so so um it's interesting because we're you know th- this is such a uh, a complex story and it's spanning decades and so so these these uh these characters are now creating some of the main characters of 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 uh the next part of the story. Exactly. So these four girls they were called Arlene, Joyce, Carolyn and Trudy. And they're all pretty different. I mean, he he does a good job of creating these characters who are very individual and and very realistic. Arlene, I think she wants to go to New York City uh and become a an actress in Broadway. She's very popular with boys. Joyce is very uh, homely and sensitive. And she's she's religious, right? Yeah, Joyce. Yeah. And Carolyn, she's very smart. She's also very fat. And uh, she's very good friends with Trudy. So here's the bloodline that's going to happen. Trudy is going to become pregnant with uh, a boy named Howie Katz. She's going to move to Chicago. We're going to jump to 1981. Uh, I, I'm sorry. We're going to jump to 1989, where uh, Howie Katz makes his way back to Paloma Grove after his mom passed away. Yeah. Joyce McGuire has twins, and and these twins are, um, you know, touched by um, the Jeff. So the twins are Joe Beth and Tommy Ray. And she gave them each two names because they had two fathers. Right. <laughs> And she becomes very religious, like her house is completely uh and she's a shut in she yeah, won't, she won't leave the house and right. she's kind of nuts and and uh Joe Beth and Tommy Ray you know resent her, Tommy Ray, especially, yeah, Carolyn, I think her name was like Carolyn Hotchkiss Hotchkiss, yeah, she has twins, uh but the boy doesn't survive. The girl is called Linda, but what happens is that she becomes so traumatized by what happened to her that she ends up killing her own daughter and commits suicide. Yeah. And Arlene, uh, who was supposed to be the, the pretty one, she ends up being barren. And so I think the idea that's inserted into her mind to have kids uh, drives her crazy. Because she can't. So in 1989, that's when Howie Katz returns to Paloma Grove. There's characters in this book that become uh, very famous in Clyde Barker stories. I mean, Harry Damore is going to be in this book. Uh, at this point, I had read only Lost Souls, uh, which was a short story where he fights the demon Chat Chat in Christmas. Oh. So you hadn't read the um, you hadn't read the uh, the Last Illusion. Uh, interesting, because I read the books of Blood. Uh, I didn't read them all at once. Like I bought the six volumes over time, and I think yeah. 
but when I bought the Great and Secret Show, I hadn't bought all the books of blood yet because I was yeah. getting them from uh, an import store in Portugal. So I had read Lost, Lost Souls on the internet. And it's amazing how much stuff Clive Barker was putting out in such a short amount of time, right? Because, I mean, the Books of Blood were 1985. Here we are. So that's six volumes. And here, 1984, 1985. And here we are, 1989. And we, you know, he's like three novels in. Absolutely. And he had written Cabal and he had written Weave World. It was a, a very good time for Clive Barker. Yeah. Um, I like the fact that he made Palomo Grove be like this uh, this group of like four little places: uh, Stillbrook, Laurel Tree, Wind Bluff, and uh, Deerdell. Right. Yeah. Kind of uh, residential neighborhoods, I guess. Yeah. In in the comic book um, written by uh, Chris Ryle, I think was it Chris Ryle? Um. And the art was Gabriel Rodriguez, I think. Um, the ad- the adaptation of the Great and Secret Show by um, yeah IDW IDW Comics. They actually made a little map where they uh, they they made a design for the map of uh, Paloma Grove. I thought it was really smart the way they did the map because they made it kind of like a cross. So on each uh, cardinal point, there's one of these little locations like uh, like Laurel Tree and Stillbrook. Mm-hmm. So they made it kind. Paloma Grove become kind of like a, a crossroad on its own. Well, yeah, that's true. So, and I wonder, um, and I wonder if that if they got that source material from Clive Barker, you know, because I'm sure he probably had some some sketches. Yeah, who knows? I mean, the, 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 I know that at the end of uh, the IDW comics, they mentioned that Gabriel Rodriguez had like um, architectural background, so he came up with that map, and you know. For for um, for the villages of uh, Paloma Grove, yeah. but so interesting these these characters, like you said, these uh, sons of Fletcher and um, and the Jaff, they will become the main characters in the story from now on. And um, also, there's this uh, investigative reporter called Nathan Grillo, and Grillo's Grillo's a, an interesting character. He's almost kind of like a discount Harry Demore in some ways. Yes, yeah, I was thinking that too, and it started to make me wonder if maybe uh, maybe Clive had kind of changed was, was going to change his mind and you know and and swap him out for Harry Demore by the end yeah. of the, uh, the end of the novel. I mean, Nathan Grillo is not uh, an uh, he's not a, a private detective. Uh, he's an investigative journalist who works for. Yeah. A bunch of seedy, like underground newspapers. Yeah. So, and I think in Everville, he um, he becomes involved with that. Um, what was the name of that? The Reef, right? You remember the Reef? Oh yes, right, right. That's yeah. going to be that group of computers and and this like. Um, yeah. It's interesting because nowadays you start thinking uh, that's kind of a kind of a non-technical approach to how computers work and the internet works but the reef would be this group of computers and search engine that would uh look for weird occurrences around the world and yeah. and archive them so but anyway that's in everville um here in this one Nathan Grillo he um gets involved in the story because there's this com- comedian called Vance uh Buddy Vance right yeah yeah, Buddy, Buddy Vance, Vance. who uh, unfortunately um, he ends up uh, falling victim of the place where uh, the virgins swam, uh, the the cave. Because underneath yeah. Paloma Grove, there's a, a big system of caves that's always like yeah. changing and shifting. You know, it's kind of reflects a little bit. Again, crossroads like tunnels meeting other tunnels underneath the yeah. city, and also because of course California is prone to earthquakes. Uh, during one of his morning jogs, uh, Buddy Vance is running over that area, and the concrete cracks, and he falls into the cave, and and he yeah, and while he's dying, Fletcher and the Jeff end up fighting over his dreams versus fight. his not, yeah versus his fears yeah versus his fears and and dreams, yeah. and so ulti- ultimately here's where the Jeff gets uh, ahead. He gets an advantage because he manages to extract Tarata from Buddy Vance's mind, and it's this weird creature with, like, dozens of legs and stuff. So he rides it out of the cave, actually. He rides yeah. that monster. Like, yeah. 
And unfortunately, Fletcher, as much as he tries, he couldn't really hold on to Buddy Vance long enough to extract some kind of like uh, dream or hero. So Buddy Vance dies and Fletcher <laughs> stays in the cave for yeah. a little while longer. Yeah, and, and what's interesting is, you know, I think going going back to Grillo, yeah. um, I think the most interesting thing about Grillo is that uh, is that Tesla Bombeck is just like some friend of his. Yeah, right. Tesla. She is the, actually the most important important character, but we don't really get introduced to her until fairly late in the story. True, and and Tesla is supposed to be a screenwriter, I think. Yeah. She's just yeah. a screenwriter, and she, she uses a lot of movie jargon while she's talking about what's going on in Palomo Grove. And Meanwhile, the Jeff is out. He decides that it's time to visit his kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the first time, the first scene, uh, one of my favorite mo- moments in the book is the first scene where uh, Tommy Ray goes outside the house, and he finds, uh, he meets the Jeff for the first time. That was really cool. I remember that story where uh, yeah. the Jeff is just kind of hiding in the trees. In the tree. and, yeah. And I thought that was amazing. And, and the way that Clyde Barker describes the Jeff uh, as his physical form is he looks like what he used to look like as a human. But at the same time, there's almost this this kind of um, spiritual – you yeah, know, it's like an aura. That, like that, an aura, yeah. Yeah, that that shows his real form, and every once in a while he lets that slip. Yeah, and his his real form is almost like a giant fetus head, rising, yeah. towering above his own uh, body. It sort of reminds me of like a you know the aliens, like a gray. Yeah, you sure. Know, great big, great big head with with big eyes and. Oh yeah. Yeah, and so, actually that scene also reminded me of Mama Puss sitting in the trees at the party. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in Weave World, um, waiting to waiting for victims to come out, or, or and she was looking specifically for um, for uh, what's his name, Cal Mooney. Cal Mooney, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's it's really interesting, and and of course, uh, he he meets Tommy Ray, and Tommy Ray is a weird character as well. I mean, Tommy Ray and Joe Beth, they're these blonde twins. They're very attractive. Everybody likes them, but Tommy Ray has this kind of like mean streak in him. He has like this yeah. weird uh perverted attraction for his own sister at one point. Yeah, even though he's everybody likes him and he pretty much has whatever girl he wants. Yeah. And so um his sister is uh, at one point the, it, it is described that Joe Beth even though she was um the Jeff's daughter, she was also touched by Fletcher uh to some extent, I think. And so that yes. maybe provides her with like the power to resist resist the Jeff a little more. Well, I don't. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think the 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 thing with her falling falling in love with Howie, mm-hmm. right? And we haven't really talked about Howie that much, but um, but it seems to me that their initial falling in love was just a weird this weird sort of feel you know overpowering feeling they had to each other that they didn't understand that they were supposed to be enemies, and yeah. so so they have this feeling like there's something about you that I'm supposed to know and I don't know what it is and they mistake it for love and I think it eventually becomes love and drives Fletcher and ja- the Jaff crazy. Yeah, there's actually a moment where um, they they take a nap together. They end up sleeping together but they don't do anything. Yeah. They just – Howie just visits her and like you said, he meets her at uh, – she's, she's a waitress at um, a store I think yeah. and Howie goes there and uh, – he just got into town, and uh, he meets her, and he becomes entranced by her. And it's almost like the, the opposites are supposed to attract each other or something. Yeah. So, well, I think she's a waitress, and she works at the bookstore. Right. And yeah. and he was looking at a book or something. He was trying to read a book. Uh, I forgot which book it was. But um, the interesting part here is that they do develop a relationship, much to the jealousy of Tommy Ray. Uh, who who doesn't who doesn't like it? He doesn't like any you know any boys trying to you know um, trying to uh, seduce his sister. Well, and he loves the fact when he finds out that uh, you know that that Howard Katz is supposed to be their enemy. I mean, that's that's the perfect excuse for him. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But even the Jaff criticizes his infatuation with his own sister at one point. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, yeah, he, 
for a man, you like your sister a little too much. Yeah, he says you shouldn't be sniffing after your own sister. Yeah, you shouldn't know what your sister smells like. Because he says <laughs> yeah. at one point something that I, c- I could smell Joe Beth on Howie, and he's like, well, I don't think you should know what your sister smells like. Yeah. That's, but, um, yeah, so... Um, so, yeah, it, it's like you said, it's almost like it's this overwhelming feeling that Howie and Joe Beth fall in love with. And at one time they, t- they sleep together and they sleep of quiddity and quiddity is the dream sea. This is, this is the thing that the shoal was meant to protect. The shoal was supposed to protect the purity of quiddity. Quiddity is the dream sea of humanity. It's, it's yeah. what in some ways I would imagine that quiddity uh, to me, it's like the place from where, the act of creation almost stems from because creation doesn't exist unless you have an idea or uh, imagination. Quiddity so, must be preserved. Yeah, and so quiddity being the place where dreams stem from, it's almost the the, the place where reality stems from. Oh yeah, it's it seems a lot like it's Young's collective unconscious in a in a, in it's a physical place created by the dream life of people. Which in mm-hmm. turn, you know, it's like feeds on itself. It like it creates dreams, and it is made of dreams, and it creates all living things. But all living things also created it. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. there is, I think, it's in the Dark Fantastic where they do that connection as well between uh, uh, Clyde Barker's uh, fascination with Jung's philosophy. Yeah. So I was trying to find that part here in my notes, but. I, well, and it reminds me of Neil Gaiman too, right? This idea that all gods come from dreams. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, like, like, uh, like the uh, Sandman, and like, if you read the novel American Gods, it's the same kind of thing. That 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 gods are created from our dream life, and they feed on our uh, on our our beliefs and our praise. I I, I love to um, I, I love when we start going into this kind of analysis and. Uh, Here's here's one thing that Doug Bradley had to say about Clyde Barker and, and The Great and Secret Show. It says here that um, uh, most notable, perhaps, is the way in which The Great and Secret Show strives to rid Barker's readers of the notion, made popular by the books of Blood and Hellraiser, that his art is intent on the explicit, the violent, the bloody, to the exclusion of more complex concerns. And then um, there's a quote from Doug Bradley where he says he could have very easily kept on churning out the books of blood for the next 20 or 30 years and made himself a millionaire. He could write 500 books of blood. It's not an issue. So I respect him for, <laughs> yeah, he says, so I respect him for, as always, not taking the easy route. He puts himself on, out on a limb. He puts himself in a position of danger of losing the audience that made him a best selling author in the first place. Hmm. So, um, like he that was, one, that one uh, art, uh, that one uh, reviewer that that got the early that uh, read the screenplay for the the um, Harry Demore. Oh yeah, uh, pre- yeah, and he, cool. he said he he said that the Great and Secret Show was where Clive Barker fell apart and stopped being true to himself. And yeah, I guess some people never really managed to get into Clive Barker's fantasy. I mean, yeah, um, I, I I will under I understand that perfectly. Some people they like horror. Clyde Barker makes this work in such a way where it's both beautiful and grotesque at the same time. And for and, me, it was like, well, if this is horror, then I love horror. You know, yeah. I, I wasn't, I wasn't pre- predominantly looking for horror things to read. I was, I was looking for stuff that was like Nightbreed, you know? Sure. Yeah. That was fascinating. Bo- both beautiful and grotesque at the same time. Like, yeah. In some ways, like the Cenobites are. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that. Uh, I love that. Uh, that dichotomy or, or um, contradiction. Yeah. I guess. So yeah. like Doug Bradley was saying that Clyde Barker put himself on a limb, he was at risk of losing the audience. But then, like I said at the beginning, this novel proved Barker's most successful book in America. It's hardcover edition ascended onto the New York times bestseller list on February 11, 1990. And it was the first of his books to sell over 1 million copies. So, um, awesome. Yeah. yeah that, that was great. That and that's great. with a and that's with a mailbox on the cover in the United States and with a kind of a long and complicated title. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, Clyde Barker said, uh, as quoted on uh, God's Monkey chapter in the Dark Fantastic, he says, um, 
What I am striving toward constantly is a fantastical metaphor for the complexity of how we experience the world. Fantasy at its best allows us both external and internal impressions. We can move from the psychological to the physical, to the surreal, and to the realistic. But the fantastic, like magic realism, I think one's a different way to describe the other, allows yeah. us a more total way to describe how we move in our lives, how we get through our lives, than realistic fiction. Because we live in our imaginations at least as much as we live in the real world. In other words, I would say fantastic fiction is a more truthful rendition or replication of the living experience. Because the living experience is also the dreaming experience, is also the fantasizing experience. And what I'm trying to represent on the page is not what it's like to get up in the morning and brush your teeth, but what it's like to get up in the morning and then dream of Never Never Land for two minutes and, they go, and then go take a crap. And what's <laughs> missing in realistic fiction is the visit to Never Never Land. Yeah. I, I understand this perfectly. I mean, we're having miracles narrated to us, and then in the next page we're – we're seeing like Nathan Grillo uh, finger bang uh, a woman. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, and and um, there's there's an there's a really interesting part, um, and and this kind of repeats in in Clive's bigger novels of uh, Tesla is trying to move reality from one place to another, and I'm not going to describe it exactly because you know we'll try to keep that um, we'll try to keep that vague, I guess. But sure, but that that happens in Weave World. Uh, where somebody's keeping an entire world in their mind, and then they and then they release it, and it becomes a real physical world. Uh, that happens in Imagica, and it happens in the Great and Secret Show. And I can't remember if it also happens in in um, in the second book of the art in Everville too. But but that but that 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 seems like a really important uh, motif that he's he's really pushing and really trying to get across is you know that that uh, that which can be imagined. Or that which is imagined need never be lost, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and and actually, there's a really cool quote from that that part of the book too that that I thought actually was kind of funny. Um, Tesla is wor doing that is doing that in the process of doing that work, or she just finished, right? And and the Jaff says, "How did you get us here?" And Tesla says, "Ate it up and spit it out." And mm -hmm. the Jaff said, "Like my hands?" And Tesla says, "No, not like your hands, not at all." Right, right, because uh, Tesla, like any female character in Clive Barker's books, the woman who discovers she can control the menstruum and weave world and stuff like that, yeah. uh, all all his characters become really uh, touched by something miraculous, and then they develop this power that allows them to reshape reality. And Tesla is not going to be any different because, remember, yeah. we still have one vial of the nuncio left. Um, but anyway, one one thing I thought was really funny – and it goes towards Clyde Barker's uh, amazing way that he mixes um, comedy, fantasy, serious stuff. Mm -hmm. Is when he's um, when the Jeff is still learning about the art. He discovers in some letters that the art was also referred to as the final great work, the forbidden fruit, Da Vinci's despair, the finger in the pie, and the butt digger's glee. So, yeah. I thought that that was hilarious. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Just making it like uh, making it philosophical and and kind of you know disgusting, I guess, at the same time. Oh yeah, yeah. It's interesting also that um, Trinity is also a recurring word and name and theme in this book, and yeah. so uh, Trinity is always being referred to. And of course, uh, if if. You know, if you've read the book, you'll know that Trinity is referring to the old uh, Nevada Proving Grounds, uh, mm -hmm. which were codenamed Trinity. This was actually called the White Sands Proving Ground, and uh, that's where they built those um, fake cities that had mannequins, like mm -hmm. the ones you see in Indiana Jones 4 and all that stuff. And, yeah, and, where and he, old... hid in a, in, he hid in a um, bathtub or something, right? Or a... A fridge. A fridge, yeah. <laughs> hey, Kisun could have survived if he had found a lead-lined fridge, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so to to localize ourselves here, we are talking about um, the Jeff. The Jeff has an advantage over Fletcher, and Fletcher is still stuck in the caves. And then eventually, when Howie goes to the city... He goes to uh, – he discovers things about his mother. He discovers things about how he was conceived. 
and he goes to uh, the woods to to look at the place where uh, where that thing happened to his mother in 1971. And so he does find Fletcher, and he Fletcher tells him that you're my son, and I need your help. And the Jaff is out there, and you know he's contacting his own children, and you're my children, so. I would like to assign you with the task of helping me. And, and I, Howie doesn't really want to do that. Howie doesn't really want to do that because I think he's afraid of, of what he's going to have to do, I, I think, of his relationship with uh, Joe Beth at one point. Well, and, 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 uh, and also Fletcher is terrible at, at, uh, at trying to convince him. Yeah, Fletcher. You know, it, <laughs> yes, but he spends a lot of time explaining to him why he should give up on – on Joe Beth and she's the enemy and, 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 you know, really that's, that's not the best way to go about somebody that's, you know, go about this with somebody that's just fallen in love with someone. Sure. Um, but it's really nice when, when he and uh, Joe Beth sleep together and go to Quiddity, that's, that's the first, um, I think at this point, I don't remember if the, the book already indicated that there was, um, three times where you could visit Quiddity. Yeah. The, the dream sea. One mm-hmm. one time was when you're born. The other time is when you sleep next to your one true love. And the third time is when, you know, the night where you're going to die. Yeah, and the so, night before. Yeah, and so it's like three dips in the dream sea. If you get less than that, you go crazy. If you get more than that, you're not human anymore. Yeah. Um. So... There's the cosm and the metacosm, and the cosm is our universe and our reality. And the metacosm is where, uh, you know, it's everything else. It's like it's quiddity, yeah. and then it's what's on the other side of quiddity. Yeah. So what's on the other side of quiddity is the Yadoroboros. Mm-hmm. And there's the ephemeris, which are the islands that are, you know, the, the land formations in, in the sea of quiddity. And quiddity is not water, right? It's like a kind of an ether. Yeah, it's it's it. I think it kind of acts like water, but it, at the same time, it doesn't feel like water. Yeah, it doesn't. Is, you don't get wet when you fall in it. Um, yeah, which is expected. So you're talking about the ephemeris, and um, <clears throat> one of the letters that Jeff finds when he's in the dead letter office it refers to uh, a, a veil and how to draw it aside, and behind it, a revelation. It was about fishes, a sea, or the sea of seas. Um, dreams and an island that is also referred as Plato's Atlantis. So the ephemeris uh, could have inspired Plato's Atlantis at some point. Yeah, and that's pretty cool. And I think, um, and and I really like that the, you know, this metaphor of, well, the the title, right, The Great and Secret Show gets used to describe what's going on. Uh, I think it's like, is it like in in a volcano on the ephemeris? There's yeah. spirits flying out of it, and and uh, and there's a character that wants to go see what's in there, and he says, you know, what did you see? And it's the great and secret show. So it's like we're we're seeing so many mysteries, and there's always layers of more mystery on top of you know whatever we're finding out. Yeah, and don't forget, Clyde Barker grew up in Liverpool, so he's used to living in a city by the sea. You know, you you go to Aberad, you have the Sea of Isabella as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I've thought at reading Aberat, I've thought a lot about if somehow that could be, you know, if that could coexist with the art, you know, the books of the art, some in some way, if the Sea of Isabella is connected uh, through the Dream Sea or as part of the Dream Sea. That's an excellent point, and also one that I wrote in my notes because I was wondering the same thing. I was wondering if. The Sea of Isabella, like you said, could be connected to liquidity and also the ephemeris. They're supposed to be islands where time doesn't pass. And yeah. in the Aberat, uh, the islands of the Aberat, the archipelago of the Aberat, it's yeah. also every island is a specific time of the day, and it's always that time of the day. And there's also um, in Aberat, there, there are these, and I cannot remember what they're called, but there are these agents from another dimension. The, you know, they're the ones that come on the Stormwalker, the... And they're 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 evil beyond anything that you know beyond like Christopher Carrion and the and his mother and and um, you know people are messing with the power of of those creatures without understanding them and and oh that are going to come through right because you've read the third book Absolute Midnight yeah. which I haven't yeah. finished yet so yeah so that 
that reminds me of the Iyad, I guess was what I was trying to say. I mean, oh, or yeah. they, they could be related or they could even be, you know, the Iyad. Well, the third book of the Abarat is called Absolute Midnight. And one of the things that is said in Great and Secret Show about the Yad is that they would bring with them an eternal night as well. Yeah, yeah. At one point, this is mentioned that the art is about the end of the world, which was in turn about its beginning. And so there is this circular notion as well that's reflected in the Magica because the Magica is a circle. Mm -hmm. And at one point I was wondering, what if the center of that circle is quiddity? You yeah. Know, that could have been like the five dominions, the realities of, you know, Clyde Barker's uh, yeah. unified <laughs> universe. Yeah. And do you remember there was a there was a novel that he had talked about writing that would unify everything and it was you know they I think with Phil and Sarah he called it like the everything book and it was really just a teaser and we don't know anything about it or if it'll ever get done but I know but, I've, uh, I think we've seen a picture of like a file box that said the everything at one point. Yeah. And I would love I would love to know if that is actually yeah. um if he actually wrote any of that or if it's just like research material. Before he wrote The Great and Secret Show, he was working with Mick Garris on this project called um, Spirit City USA. And then Spirit City USA would be a series that Barker was developing for ABC television with Mick Garris. They were going to do a one-hour pilot and um, was vaguely ba based on the Books of Blood story The Last Illusion. Mm-hmm which Clyde Barker later adapted as the motion picture Lord of Illusions in 1995. It was, in Garris's words, scary with a sense of humor. So this series would have opened on the first anniversary of the death of a famous Houdini-like magician who had perished during his greatest escape trick. His friends and mentor gather in the basement of Hollywood's Magic Castle, hopeful of his promised return from the dead. Wow. Yeah, and so... At last, when only his mentor remains, the floor cracks open and the magician appears. But before the portal to purgatory is closed, 100 spirits escape from the nether side. So each week's episode would have involved the magician's pursuit of the escaped spirits while he attempts to resolve the central mystery. His death was not accidental, but murder. And so it's funny because Nix, uh, Buddy Vance, and you know uh, Swan, they're all kind of different reflections of the same character. Yeah, this, this artist whose death sets in motion these these events and and this, um, yeah and this Mamoulian Mamoulian well, as well yeah. he yeah. didn't die but yeah so uh, it's it's interesting when you start rereading this for the podcast I started seeing all these connections that I never seen before and it may just be wishful thinking or it may just be me trying to attach things that are not attached but. I always wondered uh, – I saw this picture of Scott Bakula and Famke Jansen um, at Lord of Illusions at the end. There was this picture that I saw in Fangoria where they're both standing outside of the cabin where the cultists were, where Nyx dies. Mm -hmm. And they were looking up at the sky, and we never knew what they were looking at. Um, hmm. Before I saw the movie, I had read The Great and Secret Show, and I had read The Last Illusion, and I always wondered – if like the, he was going to put the Yad Ouroboros showing up in 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 Lord of Illusions or something, I would have loved. Oh to see, wow! I would have loved to see Nix. Um, Nix almost like this shaman, this evil shaman creature like Kasun. Yeah. Opening this portal where the the Yad's darkness would peer out and just gather over the cultists, um, you know, shack in the middle of the desert, and then the Yad would mm -hmm. step over. I mean, this is just me. I know I'm just making this up, but I, I always uh, – there was a time when I actually – before I watched Lord of Illusions, I was wondering if it was going to be that way. What were mm -hmm. they looking at? So uh, that's just something I wanted to put wow. in. Wow. Yeah, I, and I had that Fangoria, but I don't remember them that picture. Uh, yeah, I'd have to see it again. I don't remember that shot being in the movie like uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Damour and Dorothea being outside looking at the mm. sky. But I always wondered about that. Yeah. So the Shoal. The Shoal was this group of people who knew the art, who could access the art. And right. They knew about quiddity and they knew about, you know, they had – their dogma was the art and um, their heaven was quiddity, right? Yeah, and and, uh, and they wanted quiddity preserved. And, and, and there's, there's a debate 
in this novel about whether they're trying to keep people from getting in or keep the Iyad from getting out. I think w- the thing about this is that, uh, one, when anything is disturbed using the art, then mankind feels the, the vibrations of that. And the way that people experience that change is they, they start having nightmares and they, they start having problems, um, trouble sleeping, yeah. they start having all these weird dreams. Uh, especially um, further up in the novel, there's a time when the Jeff actually opens a portal into Quiddity. And by that time, Palomo Grove becomes almost deserted because people have been leaving it because people can't stand being that close to this disturbance. And yeah. uh, and the Yod starts permeating the dreams of people because as soon as the Yod realize that a hole has been opened to the Cosm, I think it's almost inevitable that they just start making their way towards it. Yep, so they're going over the dream, dream Sea and they're infecting infecting the Dream Sea with their this aura of insanity that they have. Exactly. And, um, and that's getting into people's dreaming lives and they're waking up and killing themselves. Yeah. And it's, what's interesting is that um, uh, while the Jaff is a very proactive villain, as in he actually creates this uh, army of Tarata – and he goes and he uh, he has people disposed of and enslaved. Uh, Fletcher has a more, you know, he has a more hands-off approach with the mm-hmm. whole thing, a more like self-sacrificial thing, yeah. where instead he relies on the inner, you know, goodness of people, I think, their own um, fantasies and their own dreams. Yeah to counteract uh, the Jaff's influence. So what he does is he ends up uh, sacrificing himself in order to release uh, the dreams of the population in Paloma Grove. Yeah. So he, he's not really like directing anything or he's not like, he's not like uh, gathering an army to fight against the Jaff. At this point, he just, it's almost like evil always has to be active to, mm-hmm. to attain its goal, but goodness can win just by you know, virtue of being superior to evil. Yeah. You know? Well, and the evil will undo itself, right? Exactly. That's another yeah. theme that, um, yeah. Well, that I mean, does. like the, the Jaff himself opening up the, the portal, uh, starts having a change of heart. He starts seeing what he's doing and that he's just, he might be destroying the world and he can't stop his hands. So he's, he's biting them and, 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 uh, and biting his fingers off and ripping the flesh off of his bones. Well, yeah, because this whole thing comes down in Buddy Vance's house. I mean, yeah, he he wanted basically, and this is uh, where I was going to make the connection with Ness Testament, mm-hmm. is that the Jaff uh, decides to set this uh, event at Buddy Vance's house, and he uh, gets uh, he makes sure that uh, one of Buddy Vance's oldest friends, Lamar, he he asks him to invite all of the Hollywood big shots. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. The actors right. and stuff. And so he wants to, this is kind of a crit- critique of Hollywood It's a pretty heavy handed critique of Hollywood, but he goes and he says that all those perverted like uh, secrets from all these uh, Hollywood, you know, uh, people, he wanted to take all those uh, Tarata from their minds because they would be super powerful. Yeah. And uh, and this reminded me of Julian Demond uh, doing the dinner for Wick yeah. and inviting <laughs> yeah. all these magnates and tycoons yeah. of communication, media, and Hollywood. Yeah. And uh, of course, Wick doesn't want to take anything from them except, you know, maybe just uh, he just he wants, wants to he wants them to acknowledge him and he wants to look down on them. Yeah, he wants to know who are these people who have power and he wants them to know that he's back. But yeah. in this case, uh, the Jaff wants to take this evil side of Hollywood and use it as a as a weapon. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I thought there was some kind of parallel between Julian Demont and Wick and mm-hmm. Lamar and the Jaff, except, of course, the Jaff is a much more proactive uh, character than, than Wick is. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. So, yeah, eventually – so eventually um, – and and just in broad strokes, um, of course, there's an, a portal open into Quiddity, and there's people who end up, you know, falling into Quiddity. And this is where I thought the novel really started going into heavy fantasy, and and it's like the best moment of the novel takes place uh, after this event happens, and 
and we see uh, Joe Beth and Tommy Ray, Howie Katz, they're all dragged into Quiddity, and they get to get a glimpse of the Great and Secret show. Yeah. And they get a glimpse of uh, mankind floating in Quiddity. He, they would see these, like, souls just flying around and swimming in the in the water, swimming really deep as well. I mean... Yeah. Um, it reminds me uh the ephemeris where uh, Howie Katz um, comes to the beach. He, it reminds me a lot of the 25th Hour Island of Aberat. Yeah, yeah, me too. And and this inscalable mountain and mm-hmm. and because, there's and and I think souls are flying out of the out of the center of the mountain out like a volcano. Sure, and it's like there's also this this uh, cloud. The, the top is shrouded in clouds as well, just like the 25th Hour. Yeah, and you see these these like flying things around it. So uh, again, it's it's a recurring theme in Clyde Barker, like uh, ocean yeah. islands, uh, Liverpool. I mean, yeah, being someone who grew up close to the Atlantic, I mean, I I, I live just a few yards away from the beach. It, it's something that it does resonate within people who grew next to the the ocean. It, it mm-hmm. you, even when you're living away from the ocean, you you can't wait until you get to go to the beach again, you know? It's something that becomes a part of you because I think to some extent we do feel that connection to to the ocean as the the cradle of life. Yeah, well, and he, he had a second home in Hawaii for quite a long time. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess, uh, I, I guess without spoiling the rest of it, I mean, I think... Did you have any anything more that you wanted to uh, anything more you wanted to add? Well, uh, about about um, Clyde Barker's shift into fantasy, which was something that uh, Clyde Barker always always enjoyed since he was a kid. He uh, recalls in the Dark Fantastic a similar thing being said about the Lord of the Rings by Ingestina Eubank, the person who taught me Shakespeare at university, that one day I would get beyond this and I would get to the human drama. I was 17, 18, whatever, and I remember yeah. Ingestina, who wrote a lot on Shakespeare, she's a very bright lady, saying, why do you deal with these fantastical worlds? Of course, if I'd had my wits about me, I'd have said, everything in Shakespeare is fantasy. The only thing which isn't fantasy is its observations about human nature. And if any any art is any good, then that's going to be there. It's going to be in Reservoir Dogs, it's going to be in Peter Pan, it's going to be there. Yeah. So he was talking about, you know... Um, you know, fantasy and, and how important mm-hmm. it is for him. And, you know, it's not just about human drama. Sometimes you do yeah. want to have something that's fantastic that just for the sake of being fantastic. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting that you can use a fiction to tell a truth about the world that you wouldn't be able to do, uh, just by making it all grounded in, in reality. Oh yeah. Like science fiction is the same way. Yeah. The Ouroboros. You know the the yad. It's it's it said that they had dire appetites for purity, for singularity, for madness. And the dark fantastic goes on to say they are a force of profound horror. The deepest terrors, the foulest imaginings that haunt human heads, are the echoes of their echoes. So it's like they don't put that stuff in our mind. It's just their their simple uh, nature brings this out of us as kind of this resonance, yeah. like this vibration that unearths our subconscious mud, you know, and brings it yeah. to the surface. So yeah, and and I amazing. and I find that to be a more a much more interesting hell, you know, um, the wherever that the Iad come from, uh, than than like the, the the Christian idea of hell and and Satan and stuff like that, you know, or kind of like Event Horizon or or whatever strange dimension that the Cenobites come from. Yeah, and also another reference to Hollywood is the fact that when the Jaff uh, uses the art. Uh, they compare reality to a movie. It says, it was as if the whole room were projected on a cinema screen, and the Jaff had simply snatched hold of the fabric, dragging it towards him. The projected image, which moments before had been had seemed so lifelike, was revealed for the sham it was. It's yeah. a movie, Grillo thought. The whole fucking world's a movie. And the art was the calling of that bluff, a snatching away of the sheet, the shroud, the screen. Yeah. Or in other words, the butt digger's glee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting that 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 the Jeff could get so far and understand so much about uh, about the nature of reality without really understanding what he was doing. Yeah, because 
only after he tears open reality, that's when he realizes that he didn't really know what he was doing. He didn't really – he was being yeah. too literal about the crossroads. So yeah. – uh, and then, of course, um, the the fact that he realizes this, and the fact that other characters will find him and uh, mm-hmm. you know interact with him uh, yeah. further in the movie, that brings a, a kind of a change to his point of view, and that's when he decides to help you know uh, fight the Yadurobors. But anyway, yeah. uh, so Kasun is is a very important character in this, and Kasun is, of course, the big villain of the story. I think in some ways more yeah. more than the Jeff. And he's oh yeah yeah he's an ex Shoal member and and uh, well and then there's it's hinted that he's in league with the Iad up until the very end when we find out the truth of it. Oh yeah, the thing is the loop where he uh, he is uh, trapped in is a place he couldn't he couldn't just leave because if he left the loop, the loop would fall apart and of course time would start ticking again. And the thing is he is in Trinity he is at Ground Zero. In yeah. the uh, the atomic bomb test site. So what he did was he managed to kill the shoal, and he hid their bodies in that in the buildings of that uh, town that's been built to test the bomb. So he was holding basically holding time at bay while he hid the bodies, uh, but he got caught. Exactly by Maria Morales, who yeah. who trapped him. She was one of the shoal, and she trapped him in that loop. Uh, therefore, uh, assuring that he can never leave that moment in time, he could never leave that place, because as soon as he tried to leave, you know, everything would just start ticking again, explode, and he would die. Yeah. So the only way he could leave this place was if he found someone to take his place, and he would take their body and go on into the world. Interesting, very interesting, and and also the fact that Trinity is picked as as the place for this um, ending to take place, and we're not going to go into the ending, but. I, I think it's a very fascinating, um, very fascinating place to use. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and I'd I'd read that they had originally made a circle of animals, like pigs, I think, right? You mean actual animals, or, or... yeah, yeah, that they dug a trench mm. and put put pigs in in uh, and at different levels to see what the effect was wow. for um, for the atomic blast at different you know radius from the from the center. That looks like something that they would do at the time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that does look and, like. They also got like uh, actual troops to to invade areas where they did uh, atomic testings as well. Wow. Yeah, they would put these like cards on their um, uniforms that would detect how much radiation they had uh, experienced, and they just told them to go in there and just you know just run in there and come back. Yeah. Well, and so, and. And you're a scientist, so you probably understand this better than me. But the way uh, when they were developing the atomic bomb, um, mm. the chain reaction from yes. from you know, they weren't sure that that wouldn't go on forever and destroy the world. Oh yeah, they thought they might turn the atmosphere on fire. Yeah, but they tested it anyway. Sure, I and guess it, you know th- that's kind of like the Jaff opening the hole. That's true. It's it's opening Pandora's box. I mean, yeah. You know, if you uh, watch documentaries about um, uh, Feynman, Feynman was one of the scientists who worked uh, to develop the atom bomb. And uh, he was probably the only guy who actually looked at the explosion when it happened because, uh, like he said, um, uh, vis- visible light can't harm your eyes. Uh, it's UV light that, that burns your retinas. So he put himself, uh, while everybody had those big, clunky, black... Uh, lenses to look at the explosion. He went into this big truck, military truck, because their uh, windshields are um, they, they filter UV light. So he oh. actually was there and he actually looked at the explosion when it when it happened. So he he was saying I was probably the only guy who actually looked into the explosion. <laughs> um, wow. But yeah, but but uh, they had some pretty smart people uh, developing that. So I, I think at one point they realized that that was not going to happen. They were not going to set the atmosphere on fire. But, um, yeah, that was a possibility that, that some people raised. Well, and I mean, even if there was just a tiny chance, you would, th- I mean, it, it just shows the desperation, you know, uh, to end World War II or to, to exactly. say, look, you know, look what we've got. We can, you know, look what we can do to you. Because the you, Germans were also yeah. trying to, to find the atom bomb. So at the time it was, they were, they were trying to, you know, come up with a bomb 
first, so yeah. they could win the war. And you know, if if Hitler had gotten the bomb, I mean, the world would be very different nowadays. Yeah. But it's just fantastic. I mean, it's just yeah. another fantastic element in the story. Uh, you know, the first atom bomb, the the yeah. the first rending of the veil, so to speak, mm-hmm. where we discover that we could recreate like almost a little bit of the Big Bang. And and uh, that brings power. That brings not just political power, scientific power. That's also like power beyond our dreams. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, and then the, then you go into the '80s. People are starting to worry about you know. You hear about how the United States and and Russia each have enough nuclear weapons to wipe out the Earth several times over. And and that you know, as kids, that's what we were thinking about. I mean, that's those are the things we were afraid of. Sure. I mean, I know that there are people uh, in your parents' generation who grew up in school being taught how to hide under the... The desk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Duck and cover. Yeah, in case, like, yeah. uh, a bomb hits. And, you know, obviously that would be completely irrelevant, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah. That did introduce this element of fear and paranoia into people. Yeah. Yeah. And then I guess... We'll be saving Everville for another time, but I was – when Everville came out, I was surprised about the way that some characters that you thought were dead are back and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and you know, something that you thought was a happy ending turns out not to be. And um, I don't know. I mean I think maybe just because so much – compared to the – you know, the, the – how fast he had written other books, so much time had gone by between The Great and Secret Show and, and Everville. And and even more so now. I mean, if you go from Everville to whenever the third book of the art's going to be done in probably at least three years. Oh yeah, and um, I was also, you know, I was a little disappointed when I got Everville and I found out, oh, this guy's back. Oh, that guy's back. And I was like, yeah. But then it's like when you read the Great and Secret Show, and I'm not going to say who which character does this, but. Even at the end, there's like this character who's supposed to die, but then just before the book ends, this character comes back. So you're like, oh, okay, so this character managed to survive after all, even though Mm -hmm. we were given this bit about, you know, self-sacrifice and all that stuff, but this character still made it. It'll be interesting rereading those now and seeing what we think at this time, you know, at this read-through versus how we felt the the, the first time around. Because I think... I think that I may have only read Everville once or maybe twice. I really like the um, one of the covers for the Grand Secret Show that's um painted uh, this wonderfully painted cover. It's got Groucho Marx in the cover. It's got it's got yeah. demons. It's got um it's got the engineer. engineer yeah. From Hellraiser. Yeah. Yeah, and and they're all like around this this frame of a of a picture of Joe Beth and Tommy Ray. Yeah. I, I mean Joe Beth and and Howie I never, I never held in my hands this this edition. I don't even know if it's an American edition or something. No, that's but... that's the UK uh, first edition. Ah, that's, that's really the one beautiful. that I have. Yeah, I should probably try to get a copy of this one. Yeah. Um, in the comic book, and on the back, there's a there's a picture of of the Jaff and and Fletcher. Oh, do you have that one? Yeah. Oh, I never saw the back of that. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll I'll put a picture in the in oh, the show notes. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um also another thing I was going to say in the comic book, in the chapter where Fletcher uh, sacrifices himself to bring about the dreams of the people of Paloma Grove. Mm-hmm. Um these characters are depicted as like glowing, almost like TV like personalities and superheroes and uh one of them is a super Clive Barker. I don't know if you noticed noticed this, but in one of the panels, there's this uh, Superman-like figure that's got this diamond shape on his chest, and there's a C and a B, and the face looks just like Clive Barker. Really? That, that's one of the halluc- the final hallucinogenia. Yeah, yeah. It's really it's really amazing. Uh, I thought that was a funny funny detail in the comic books. Wow. Yeah, he's got CB, and then his face is Clyde Barker with a little goatee. And I thought that was that was amazing. And hey, there's a character in here that's a, that's a realtor, and he actually is pretty important. William Witt? Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't really have a, a happy story arc, but... Uh, no. No. 
but he is a realtor, just like you, and he does meet the Jaff when he's doing a showing of a house. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 a cool Yeah. One. I think I see the super Clive Barker you were talking about. There's yeah. like a kid wide a computer and then there's the super Clive Barker behind him. Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's <laughs> Oh, and it says CB on the on his chest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this this great passage also, just to, to conclude this, says that uh, mind was in matter always. That was the revelation of quiddity. The sea was a crossroads, and from it all possibilities sprang. Before everything, quiddity. Before life, the dream of life. Before the thing solid, the solid thing dreamt. And mind, dreaming or awake, knew justice, which was therefore as natural as matter, its absence in any exchange deserving of more than a fatalistic shrug. It merited a howl of outrage and a passionate pursuit of what? If she wished to live beyond the impending holocaust, it was to shout that shout, to find out what crime her species had committed against the universal mind that it should now be tottering on execution. That was worth living to know. This is this is where uh, Tesla realizes what the revelation of quiddity is. Mm. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And and it's interesting that she's a screenwriter and that she creates fantasy worlds, you know, for a living. And also the uh, the one country living one immortal day. You know, uh, you can also connect that to the loop. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. Because the loop is like a moment of lost time, so the yeah. it just kept on going. I, you know, I think that um, as the loop is, you know, like like it says right here in God's Monkey, as time in the loop is unfettered, the beginning of man's last madness, the nuclear explosion, and the promise of evolution, find the yad undone, sealed in a moment of lost time. So, it's, yeah, it's like they're taken away from the now into this loop and. That's how they're defeated, I guess. Yeah. Well, and and were they blown up with the atomic bomb? I don't know. Can that even hurt them? Well, it can definitely do something to the portal, I guess. That's, yeah. That's how I saw the ending, was that the portal was destroyed before they could cross hmm. over. Yeah. And we, we we find out more about the yacht in Everville, but like you said, that's going to be a story for another time. Yeah, gosh, I I remember I remember the Green and Secret show so much better than I remember Everville. Yeah, it's this is such a complex book that I I I hope that we did justice in this yeah. episode. But also, it's like it's it's a book that I could probably study it for weeks, like we've done, yeah. and we would mm -hmm. probably still not be able to verbalize everything that we feel about this book mm -hmm. it's it's hard because you have to read it to experience it you know yeah ultimately yeah. there's a lot of interpretations for the story that they're very personal and private and uh, only each reader will be able to discover that for his own i think that for a clive barker fan um it would be tough to skip this one i mean i think it's this is this is really kind of the beginning of i mean you could say that about weave world i suppose too but uh, this is kind of more of the beginning of the of this uh, of of the direction that Clive was was going to go. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. This is this is like the beginning of Imagica in some ways, uh, mm -hmm. because Imagica is Clive Barker's fantasy at its finest, I think. Yeah. But you know, this, the, yeah, it's almost it, this is a a book of prose that to me, as as a teenager or a young adult. I I read this pr prose almost like poetry. It's like these phrases would almost – they're so complex and they're so finely honed and, and, and crafted that to me that almost sounded like poetry. And that's what made me fall in love with Clive Barker's books because The Great and Secret Show is Cli – it, it's Clive at his finest, just like in Magica. Yeah. I, I cannot – I cannot exp explain this in any other way than you read this. You read a paragraph from this book, any any part of it. You just read a paragraph, and it, it's just so poetic. It's so wonderful, so crafted. Like yeah, like this part where uh, the Jaff uh, realizes that it was not about love, at least not as a sentimentalist knew it, nor about death, as a literalist would have understood the term. It was, in no particular order, something to do with fishes, and the sea, and three ways to swim there, and dreams, and an island, which Plato had called Atlantis, 
but had known all along was some other place. It was about the end of the world, which was in turn about its beginning, and it was about art. So uh, to me, this, just this paragraph, it's so beautiful. And you can take any page in this book and find a paragraph that's just as rich. Yeah. So that, that yeah. I guess that's the only way I can tell you. Go read this book. Yeah, and I think like, you can appreciate it more. I mean, we we could appreciate it even more now uh, than than back then. Yeah. And I, I think I'm, I'm looking forward to reading Imagica again because I had a hard time um, – following so many i mean we will talk about a magic another time but so many chapters open up with a new character it's like wait who what who's this person what about the last one that we were just talking about and i would lose track of who they all were and you got you got main characters and then there you got clones of the main characters and and um but now i think i would be able to follow that a lot better oh yeah yeah magica so this book, for me, it's amazing. It's one of the, the first um, books that really knocked my socks off. Uh, books of Blood yeah. was interesting because it was horror, and, you know, I, I was I was a horror kid, and yeah. I liked horror movies, and I liked Hellraiser, so that was interesting. But this was the one that really started opening my, my horizons. Yeah, uh, me too. Weave World first. Weave World, I think, I read it afterwards. Yeah, from Grand this was, Show. Th- this for for me when I first became a fan of Clive Barker, this this was the current novel, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so Cabal was just barely out, and the Great and Secret Show was the new one. And then I, as I was collecting and trying to read as much as I could, then uh, then um, Imagica and the Thief of Always came out. Oh yeah, like I said, go get this book right now if you've never read it. Yeah. And it, just go buy this book. It's a beautiful book, and it's 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 so amazing the story. I mean, go get this one in Everville because once you put yeah. this one down, you're gonna want to pick up Everville immediately. Yeah, uh, Everville expands on the whole story of some of these characters. It it it's almost like a prequel, and then it it picks up after this book yeah. comes off. Yeah, and 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 um and it it follows straight you know, from there. And I, and, and I think when I, um, when I heard that Everville was coming out, I went back and reread the great and secret show and then read Everville as soon as it, you know, arrived or as soon as it was available. Like I said, this book's amazing. Go get it right now. What are you waiting for? Just go on Amazon, buy it. If you, if you can't afford it, just, just buy a, a one cent copy. It's worth it. Yeah. The paperback for sure. The paperback, just buy it and read yeah. it because you're going to love this book. It's going to change your life. It yeah. changed my life. I mean, I wouldn't be the person I am today if I hadn't read The Great and Secret Show and, 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 and started reading all of Clyde Barker's books. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, without The Great and Secret Show, then um, that opened the gates for Imagica, right? Which was um, which was a much even bigger and more complex and more uh, philosophically interesting even than, than, uh, than The Great and Secret Show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was, a, I was pretty bookish when I was a teenager. So for me, these things were like – magic doorways into the fantastic and and it was at the same time expanding my mind uh yeah. and making me unafraid of trying other things and um you know thinking out of the box over some some issues and putting aside my prejudices and realizing that you know there's there's um even though you you can like horror i mean horror is not harmful to you in any way unless you become obsessed with it but Fantasy really, really makes you. Fantasy really expands your horizons. It, it really yeah. makes you creative. It 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 almost it it flips a switch in your brain. And trust me, it's good. I remember one time I was reading. Uh, I was in high school, and I I had brought Imagica with me to the lunchroom, and I was reading at lunch. And uh, and at one point, I had stopped after some passage, and I was just kind of staring and thinking about what I'd read. Mm-hmm. And then this girl at the table across from me goes, I have a boyfriend. And I'm like, oh, God, no. And I and I got so embarrassed that I, like, folded up my book and I left and I, and I ate in the library from the uh, – or uh, or outside for the whole rest of the year. <laughs> so uh, you were you were upset that she broke your fugue state? Yes. <laughs> and it was yeah. such a mundane and, and banal thing to say. Well, you were, you were contemplating, like, the, the – the dream life of humanity. And she's like, I have a boyfriend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. 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 It's good. P- people should, should be more 
contemplative and, and people yeah. should like introspect a little more. This this book made me more introspective and, and you know, that's always a good thing. Yeah. <sighs> I guess it's probably we're over two hours, so it's probably it's probably a good time to 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 uh to cut it off. Yeah, I guess if we have any other things we'd like to add, I think we can always like uh do a blog post and, and expound more on themes yeah. about Grand Secret Show. Like I said, thanks a lot, guys, for supporting us and listening to us. And yeah. I, I will try to get more, you know, video content and other different kinds of content with Ryan. You know, we we're thinking about even making like a, you know, a commentary track, for example, maybe for maybe for Nightbree. Who knows? Maybe if yeah. we can if we can figure out how to make it work uh, yeah. on Skype, then we will definitely record something like that. So you guys can watch the director's cut and listen to our commentary track. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. So stay tuned. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, hopefully this wasn't too long. And, uh, and, and thanks for listening. Yep. Thanks a lot. And th keep supporting the podcast. You can reach us on the web at www.cliveparkercast.com. Leave us a review on iTunes. We're on Podomatic, Xbox Music Store, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, Double Twist, BlackBerry, and Pocket Cast. Like our page on Facebook and join the Occupy Median group. On Twitter, we're at BarkerCast and at Occupy Median. The forum is www.clivebarkerfans.com slash forum. Opening theme by Colin Lakativa. <laughs>